Hello, welcome to the preview edition of The Outside Fence. I'm your host as always, Tristan Heffernan. With me is my racing expert, Stuart Bowles-Brown. Bowles, we're going to dive into two races today. It's the Everest and the Caulfield Cup. Uh, how are the confidence levels on both? Uh, not too bad. Both are, look to be very open races, so um, yeah, you could probably make a case for a few horses outside the market, but yeah, particularly the Caulfield Cup looks a bit of a raffle to me, but uh, we'll do our best to try and steer the viewers uh, in the right direction. Beauty, you did tip us into a winner last week on our, our first preview show, finding Ole Kirk in the Caulfield Guineas. Uh, we totally bombed out on the 1,000 Guineas, so we've got a bit to work on. We're going to go straight into the Everest as our first race to preview. Just a reminder, if you do like the preview shows, give us a like, subscribe, leave us a comment, a bit of love on Twitter, every little bit helps, and uh, we'll try and keep these going through the, the spring if uh, enough people are watching them. So let's get stuck into the Everest. First of all, we're going to pull up the the market, uh, as we do to start off. Interesting to see all the support that's come from Nature Strip so far this week, Balls. Yeah, it is, a, it is quite interesting. Um, I suppose his last two starts, he's underwhelmed a bit, but he does have those short SPs um, out of those two starts. So um, it's hard for him to get too long, I suppose. And also, he's obviously a very high-profile horse and um, a horse that yeah, punters tend to warm to. Yeah. We will go and have a look at the speed map uh, as we look to get stuck into this 12-horse field. There we go. Now, the first thing that strikes me there, Balls, is there, there's not a lot of pressure uh, on paper for Nature Strip. Now, I don't expect that to necessarily be the case, given it's the Everest they're racing for $15 million or whatever. You expect that there's a couple of these horses drawn wide that are going to push forward to try and get across, but uh, the lead does look to be there for Nature Strip, doesn't it? Yeah, I think providing he jumps well... Uh, or jumps sort of adequately, um, yeah, he can definitely find the front. <clears throat> now, the map I've done there is almost a bit of a best-case scenario, I think, for a lot of horses. Horses such as um, particularly Bivouac drawn 10 and even Guitra drawn 7 possibly have little tricky uh, tricky maps early. Um, there's obviously a chance Bivouac can get caught wide, and I think Guitra, it's important for him to jump well and possibly... Um, come across to be almost sort of outside nature strip and then take a bit of cover on Eduardo. That's probably best case scenario for him. Um, and then you've got the other sort of on speed horses like Hort Brion here and a dollar for dollar who are both drawn well, who I assume will be sort of pushing up. So there is a chance that there could be good speed there, but um, if they do find their spots um, sort of relatively early, um, yeah, it could mean that this, the pace sort of drops out of the race as much as it can with a horse like nature strip in the race. Okay, Libertini is one that stands out there on the map. It has been the only one there in the three-wide line. What are your gut thoughts on, on what they decide to do from that barrier? Yeah, I'd assume they're more negative than positive um, out of the gates. I suppose they'd be hoping a horse like Bivouac gets stuck three deep or another horse in front gets stuck three deep and then they get a nice bit of cover there. That's her great chance in the race. I think if she ends up three-wide without cover, I think that's probably curtains for her chances. Okay, finally, Classic Legend... Um, drawn middle of the line is there any chance he settles a little bit closer if the speed isn't right on yeah there is some chance he could be a pair or maybe a pair closer um, I tend to think he goes best sort of ridden a bit bit quieter and sort of having that last shot at them I don't think it's the end of the world if he sort of held up for a while as we'll sort of see in his first up um, first up win in the shorts he was very dynamic late after um, after getting sort of held up for a lot of the straights so I think uh, that kind of style can really suit that horse. Okay, we're going to look at four of these lead-up races uh, to go through these horses' chances here, three in Sydney and one down there in Melbourne. The first one we're going to look at is the Concord Stakes. Now, this is where Nature Strip was a very dominant favourite and Guitra announced himself as a major Everest player. Uh, one of the key parts of this race was Ball of Muscle kicking up to hold out Nature Strip. But uh, let's talk about Guitra here. Um, obviously, very well suited at 1,100 metres. Does the 1,200 metres of the Everest hold any fears for you, Balls? 
It does a little bit. Um, he's only won one from seven uh, lifetime at the 1200, but if you do look at his form sort of over the past 12 months, his 1200 metre form has been sort of very good uh, without winning. But um, this is obviously a, a high quality field. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a concern if you're going to be backing Gitra, sort of what position he gets into. And I think that's why it's very important for him to get that sort of soft run uh, behind the speed because, um, yeah, I don't, I think sort of 1,000, 1,100 is his best distance. Uh, but yeah, 1200 is not impossible, but um, I think he needs the right run. Okay, we'll talk about Nature Strip when we get to his, his next run, but that was when the alarm bells were sort of starting to ring. He's having a couple of issues at the barriers at the trials, yada, yada, yada. So we'll look at him once we get to the premiere, but following the Concord, we had the shorts to deal with, uh, and this is where Classic Legend showed that he was back in a bang, and uh, he's gone through to... to to be currently he's just favorite ahead of nature strip here now classic legend is the gray back in the field in the red and white there's a few runners in this race though balls that we've got to keep an eye on coming towards the everest yeah there's eduardo in the sort of yellow colors looming up and then bivouac in the blue um outside him are uh, they the main ones um this race was run at a slow tempo so eduardo was three wide no cover but i don't think it was a huge penalty um, and Bivouac was sort of three and four wide as well. But as you'll see, Classic Legend early in the straight found a bit of trouble, but then got out late and yeah, hit the line very hard to win. Uh, Bivouac and Eduardo both ran well, um, but sort of Classic Legend was sort of the, the best horse on the day. Um, as far as, I suppose, these horses going to an Everest, obviously Classic Legend's near enough to favourite. Um, and it's sort of, I suppose, deservedly so. Um, whereas horses like Bivouac and Eduardo, um, they're probably a, sort of a rung below um, what it takes to win an Everest and would need things to sort of go their way. But um, as I said, it's a wide open race and they're probably both not hopeless. I'd probably lean to favouring Eduardo over Bivouac um, in the Everest. But um, yeah, both, I think, is more periphery chances than sort of main chances. Okay, when we talked on the show about the shorts... Uh, you did mention about Bivouac being much better in softer run races and that his record has shown that. Uh, even with Nature Strip controlling the speed here, do you think they might be going a little bit slick for, for Bivouac? Yeah, I think he, like, he likes to sort of get right on top of the speed and dominate a bit, whereas, yeah, I don't think he's going to get the chance to do that here. Um, and if he does, he's obviously going to have to go at a fairly fast pace early to, if you wanted to say, sit outside um, Nature Strip. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think really the, the race shape is going to suit him, and particularly with a horse like Nature Strip in the race. Um, it always means that there's, there's at least some speed on and they're not just going to, they're not going to walk. Okay, we're going to go and have a look at the premiere. So... I'm going to pause it here because we've got a few to, to deal with. We've got Nature Strip leading. Uh, three wide outside the leaders here is Classic <coughs> Legend coming through the shorts run. Libertini is just in behind them getting a beautiful run in the blue and white. Um, and they're the, the main three we're going to look at here. Balls now. Um, obviously Classic Legend was trapped wide here so there was plenty of merit in its defeat but uh, this is real alarm bell stuff for, for Nature Strip, given although he did a bit of work to hold the lead there from standout, um, did he do any more work than what we'd maybe expect to see him do hold the lead in the in the Everest this week? No, like he didn't, he didn't overdo it in front or have any sort of massive amount of pressure on him, so he didn't really go any faster than he usually does. Um, so, yeah, that was a concern. Obviously, out of this race, he pulled up with, a, um, with some mucus in his trachea, uh, which sort of is another issue you can add to the list this preparation he's had so that's not ideal but um yeah classic legend to me even though it didn't win this race was clearly the best run in this race um sort of working three wide no cover working up towards the leaders libertini had the lovely um suck behind um classic legend that's what she loves um as we saw with the map um that we put up prior to these replays uh libertini looks to be in some pain on saturday map wise so um yeah, I'd say it's a million to one chance he's going to get a similar run to what she got here. Um, and I think uh, Classic Legend would turn the tables on her on um, on Saturday. Okay, what are your thoughts on this uh, uh, this mucus that we've uh, we've been reported for Nature Strip? Um, clearly, a lot of people are buying it because he's been well backed, which I assume is because people have seen that. Seeing that he's going to find the lead here without too many worries, um, and they're happy to forgive that run 
on that basis. So uh, are you as, as bullish as what the market seems to be? Uh, probably not. It's obviously forgivable to a degree because not everything's gone right. And I suppose particularly I'm no vet or expert in this area, but I think for a horse like Nature Strip, who's sort of a hard-going, fast horse, having any issues in that sort of windpipe sort of area uh, probably isn't ideal for him. But um, as I said, the excuses are starting to mount up a bit, this preparation, and particularly for a big race like the Everest, I tend to like my horses that I've backed to just be ticking ticking every box, had no issues, had perfect preparation because I think it's hard enough at this level to win races as it is, but to sort of have setbacks going into it and things not going to plan is just an extra hurdle that you need to overcome. All right, let's take a, a different tact here. We're going to go and look at the other way of going down in Melbourne with the Gill Guy Stakes. Now, these probably aren't uh, the top line, as it's fair to say. We've got a couple coming through this race, though. Well, three of note. We've got Tefane in the the dark blue with the yellow cap just in behind the leaders there. Uh, we've got Dollar for Dollar, who has taken Farnan's place in the Everest. Good call by you, Balls. You were very sceptical that Farnan was going to make the race, and you've been proven correct. Dollar for Dollar's in those Tony McAvoy white, orange, and blue colours basically leading. And then we've got the old stage of Santa and Elaine out the back there in the lighter blue with the yellow cap. Now, post this race, you were um, quietly confident that Tefane was going to run a race in the Everest. Has your mind changed at all in the past week or two? Uh, no, it hasn't. I'm still sort of bullish to a degree about uh, Tefane's chance in the Everest. Uh, like, the barrier draw isn't the end of the world for it drawing 11. Maybe I wouldn't have might have drawn sort of maybe in the middle somewhere, so it possibly settled like a pair or two closer. But, um, yeah, I don't think it's the end of the world. And as we saw here, Tefane was very unlucky, and you can make a very strong argument that should have won this race, uh, sort of going back to the inside there after being held up. Despite being held up, and actually still ran the third fastest last 200 of the meeting, um, which I think was a great effort. Um, Santa Ana Lane there is just sort of about a length behind. Um, it was only first up into this race, but the stable had been sort of pretty vocal um, before this race, saying it was more forward than usual um, going in. So, um, I, like, I don't think it's going as well as it has been in the past. I'd be sort of surprised if it could, could win an Everest based off its first up run. Um, and then we had Dollar for Dollar, obviously, that's just been beaten in this race. Um, pretty much a late late comer to the Everest. Um, it's likely to map right behind Nature Strip. I don't think it's a winning chance, but yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if Dollar for Dollar could run sort of first five or six, given um, he's going to be following probably the right horse in the race um, and likely have every chance. Yeah, so most have been giving Dollar for Dollar no chance there, but maybe in the wider exotic sea. He might sneak in there on the benefit of that run. Now, there's obviously there's a, a couple of other runners we need to talk about that we haven't pulled up a replay for. I'm going to bring up the market. We'll go through them. Now, number two, Trekking. This is a horse that you also threw out for us on, on one of the review shows for the outside fence. Um, has been, I think it was after its Moya run when it ran a really good second uh, behind... Pippi over the 1,000 metres. Are you still happy with uh, how trekking is, is shaping up for this race? <coughs> yeah, I am. Um, obviously, 1,000 metres last start was sort of, um, it's not its best distance, um, but up to a twelve hundred, up to the 1,200 metres uh, definitely suits it. It's got a recent win over Gitra and the Goodwood um, and also did run third in this race last year um, coming from well back. And it, to me, it looks it looks like I can find, settle a bit closer from that gate four. Obviously, we've got it sort of settling pretty much almost second half of the field, but I wouldn't be shocked if it settles a little bit closer than that. Um, and, um, yeah, I think it's sort of got, going into this race a bit under the radar, trekking. Um, and, yeah, it's a great chance. Yeah, I do tend to agree there with trekking, especially that, that inside draw. It, I think for it to win a race like this, it's going to it's gonna want a nice suck up. It's going to need luck at the right time, but... Uh, it all points out pretty well for, for trekking from that gate. Now, another one we've got to talk about is Behemoth, who's taken Melbourne by storm so far this spring with a couple of weight for age victories in, well, one uh, dominant weight win in the Rupert Clark. Um, now it comes back to 1,200, drawn inside. It has run very well in Sydney uh, last season when it, it bombed the start in the Golden Eagle. Um, what sort of chances are you giving it here in the Everest Bowls? 
yeah, I, I, I'm not going to fall off my chair if it wins because it's going so well, this preparation, and I'm sort of a big fan of the horse. I think it's sort of imp- pretty much improving every prep it has and it's sort of right at the top of the game at the moment. Um, you saw there it's drawn gate two, and on the map we've got it sort of mapped near enough to last sort of on the inside there, which is a pretty tricky spot for a horse like Behemoth, who's a big horse as well, and he loves a bit of room. So, um, yeah, he's, he's not a horse I could back in the race, but I've got plenty of respect for the horse. And um, if they do overdo it in front and it becomes a bit of a war, um, he's obviously one of the, going to be one of the stronger horses in the race. And if he does get that luck to sort of get to the outside at some stage, um, yeah, as I said, I wouldn't fall off my chair if he's sort of coming over the top of them. But, yeah, I've got others in front of it at this stage. Okay. And finally, uh, this was the, the, well, the last horse to... To make the field before we lost fun and that's Hortbury on her who's a bit of a newcomer to this type of scene um twenty six dollars there but i've seen um i've seen a little bit of a spruik around for this horse uh do you give it any chance very very rough chance as i said there's not too many horses in this race that i can put the pen through and say just can't can't win um so very very rough chance it's win first up in mayor's grade was very dynamic very impressive. Then we stepped out to the 1400 last start and had to do plenty of work uh, to find the front and just tied a bit late. Um, obviously, it's probably not the ideal prep for an Everest, going sort of 1200 to 1400, now back to 1200. It was a bit of a late call up for the race. So the thing is, a lot of these other horses have had sort of this one target in mind um, the whole preparation, whereas I suppose this has been a bit of a not not really an afterthought, but sort of it's come up late on the radar for a horse like Hortbury on her. As you saw there, she's probably going to map well in this race. Um, we'll likely get every chance, but yeah, I, I've got a fair few ahead of her. All right. Well, leaves us one thing to do now, and that's to have a look at our tips for the race. Um, Balls, you're sticking strong with what you've thrown out there for the viewers in the, the past week or two. Yeah, well, I haven't seen anything uh, since we discussed uh, this race maybe a couple of weeks ago uh, to change my mind. At this stage, obviously, the barrier draw with Tefane, it's not the end of the world, but it's possibly not absolutely ideal. But I think that's sort of reflected in her price. She seems to have drifted a little bit. So, um, yeah, as I said, I think this is a wide open race. I'm happy to steer away from the... Um, from those at the top of the market um, and have something on uh, yeah, trekking into Farno, who both look pretty good odds to me. Um, as far as the one up the top of the market who I'd be sort of, oh, I think deserves to be favourites, definitely Classic Legend. Um, but yeah, at this stage, um, I'd probably want a bit better price for it uh, before backing it. Okay, the one you mentioned there, Classic Legend, that is my tip for the race. So I've been very taken by both its runs leading in here to the Everest and uh, with a, a nice barrier draw uh, I think it ticks a lot of boxes so uh, I think it might be its biggest day of its career on Saturday Classic Legend. I do agree with you there on, on well both Trekking and Tefane. I'm going to lean to Trekking given that uh, that inside draw. I think it's just going to get that smother that it wants and I think it's definitely a big player around that double figure quote. So that is our look at the Everest. Uh, now it's time, balls, for us to go and have a look at the Caulfield Cup. This might take us a bit longer to get through. Very, very open race, as most of these cups generally are. And despite my binocular work down at Werribee, we've got a bit to deal with in terms of internationals. But first of all, let's bring up the betting market. Obviously, we've got the 18 runners. We've lost Actow just before we've come to air here. Um, as if I could be stuffed coming up with a new graphic uh, given his withdrawal. But uh, was it fair to say the or well, Raheen House gets into the race? We might talk about him at the end balls. I assume we won't have to talk about him for too long. Um, anything oh, catch your eye? Was... Sorry. One word on him will be sufficient. All right, Beauty. Anything catch your eye on the on the market when you initially looked at it? Uh not a huge amount. As I said, this is a race that's um, very wide open. You throw in the internationals. You throw in a little bit of dubious local form with the Turnbull as well. A lot of these horses are coming through. So, yeah, very tricky race to my eye. Um, and, yeah, I'll try my best to uh, to try and decipher it. All right. Um, just as tricky as coming up with a speed map given all the, the different form lines, you've found Finch as our leader here, Balls. Yeah, look, there's no real dynamite leader on paper, so um, that makes the map even a bit more trickier. But, yeah, I'd 
definitely expect a horse like Finch to go forward, considering um, it tends it's it's a bit one paced, and I think it's better with a sort of a rolling speed. Uh, Dala San at twenty four hundred, I'd probably expect to go forward too. Then there's a few horses who are drawn wide in um, Anthony Van Dyke um, and even Prince of Aaron, who are likely to roll forward as well. Um, as I said, yeah, this map is very much up in the air, um, given that a lot of these horses, probably in an ideal world, um, tend to settle around midfield or sort of handy. So, um, yeah, I've had the best guard as I can, but, um, yeah, I wouldn't take it as gospel. Absolutely. So are you expecting uh, a below-average tempo here for this cup? Is there anything that could sort of bust things wide open for us and if you're on a back marker you've got a bit of hope because something might just take off and get going not really like the only um uh, yeah i would say below average tempo and the thing is i can't really see a horse who is gonna um be a sacrificial lamb so to speak um Mm -hmm. and really want to take this race on a lot of those horses are sort of yeah either get back they want to take a sit um i actually did hear an interesting comment I'm not sure where, but um, you do find with a lot of Caulfield Cups, a lot of the jockeys do get itchy, itchy trigger fingers, so they can get going at around the 800 and sort of take off down the side there. So that can sort of inject a bit of speed into the race. And even though they have, they can go sort of at a below average speed, um, it can make it somewhat of a staying test, given that sort of they're on their bikes nice and early for home, and it it can be a bit a bit of a war in the end. Yeah, that's a very good point. If you um. If you're the one sucking in behind them, uh, the slow tempo is not necessarily a a bad thing as long as you get to have the last crack if they've, they've poured the pressure on early. So that's definitely yeah, something we, to think about. If you look at last year's race, that was sort of what happened. I think it was Vow and Declare and something else sort of took off quite early and the eventual winner, Murder Glass, got a lovely uh, card up into the race and obviously it settled well back in the field, but even given the slow tempo, it was able to win the race uh, due to the fact it got that lovely... Um, that lovely card in the race. Okay, beautiful. Now we're going to show two races um, of the lead-ups and then we're going to go through these runners one by one in rather quick fashion. But first of all, just as a special treat for you, I know you love your overseas racing balls, we're going to have a look at a race called the pre Foy, which was won by the top weight here, Anthony Van Dyke. Now it's in front of the moment in those darker colours uh, and there's a reasonably good horse outside in balls. Yeah, Stradivarius in the uh, yeah, sort of black with a yellow cap there. Um, now, this race is over 2,400, which is obviously the Caulfield Cup distance um, and a distance that Anthony Van Dyke's performed quite well at um, in the past. The big thing with this race is they went extremely slow in it and it was very much a sprint home, um, which obviously that sort of a bunch finish you can sort of... Uh, sort of guessed by that um so it's probably going to be obviously a different tempo on saturday um this is his most recent run um like it's you can probably say from that the horse the horse is obviously going okay i think um but yeah i think the big thing with anthony van dyke is um a lot of his best form particularly this preparation seems to be on dry ground um and if we just look at the forecast for saturday and the lead up um, purely on the lead, the lead up before Saturday, it seems okay. Like it, it'd likely be a good track if that was just the case. But yeah, Saturday, um, depending where you look, there can be anywhere between five and twenty mils of rain um, on Saturday, which um, starting off in the morning. Um, so um, obviously, if that hits, it's going to be a huge um, issue for Anthony Van Dyke. Um, but as we know that this last month, the forecast is sort of, they haven't had the best month and <laughs> they've been off a bit. So, um, yeah, I'd be keeping an eye on the heavens, um, probably not betting at this stage on the horse, uh, because I'd personally, for me, a big part um, of his chances will come down to the track conditions. Okay. Question without notice. What are your thoughts on horses with human names? I'm a fan, actually. <laughs> I love yeah, all animals with human names. I don't think it's done enough. Um, there was the cult hero, Ian, that went around not long ago. I think it was sold in Hong Kong. But, yeah, I'm quite a fan of um, horses with human names. All right, beautiful. Anthony Van Dyke. Uh, interesting, uh, all the breeding buffs out there would, uh, would love. It's out of an Aussie mare, Believe and Succeed, who uh, was with Mark Kavanagh. I remember it to be a sprinter it's also a half brother to a former group one sprinter in bounding so 
Um, obviously, all the, the Galileo fanboys, they'll tell you what a champion he is getting this horse out to 2,400 metres. Uh, we don't see too many sharp Galileos in Australia balls. This might be the best one we've seen. Yeah, it'd have to be right up there. I'm uh, yeah, no expert on breeding, but um, <laughs> I've never seen a few Galileos around that um, me or you could probably beat home on foot, I reckon. But... Rock Stardom was the one that came to mind. Uh, yeah. Galileo out of Maccabi Diva, and it's a shame Red, the... Red uh, 5,000. It's a shame the Jericho wasn't around back then for rock stardom. He might have, he might have shown up in that. Anyway, let's uh, have a look at our other lead-up race we're going to go through, and that is the Turnbull Stakes. Now, there's all number of horses coming through here, balls. Uh, I'm going to have a go at trying picking a few out. Coming widest of all there in the red and the blue is Very Elegant, the eventual winner, and basically our favourite at the moment for the Caulfield Cup. Uh, we've got another mare in toffee tongue on the other extreme back there on the fence in the white with the red stripes we've got finch in uh, those famous white green and the pink cap coming just inside very elegant uh, he's become a bit of a mainstay of our cups now finch we've got master of wine on his back there in the yellow cap uh, we've got warning well back in the field in the purple cap is basically last with the red colors there and uh, Dallas San, his four-year-old running mate, he's in those Leon McDonald uh, red, white and blue colours with a blue cap just in behind the leaders. Um, colours that have been successful before in a Caulfield Cup balls, I'm sure very um, close to your heart, Serious Speed won the Caulfield Cup in those colours. Southern Speed. I Southern think. Speed, yeah. Speed. Serious right. Speed was a very handy horse in its own right, but yeah, it did uh, have a small result on Southern Speed when it won the Cup, so that was uh, that was nice. But yeah, if those colours salute on Saturday, I'll I'll be uh, there won't be a result for me. <laughs> All right, let's um, let's run the replay and I'll, I'll let's, oh, let's kick us off with Very Elegant. Uh, that seems an obvious place to start. To yep. So she it, this was a race that there wasn't much speed on paper, and it sort of worked out that way. They only went at a very slow tempo. It was very much a bunch finish. Uh, very elegant, yeah, settled back in the field here and made a long, wide run, sort of on a day when it wasn't sort of massively advantageous to do it, given there was a sort of a strong a strong headwind on the day. Um, so, yeah, it was a very strong win here. Uh, plus, this was, on, this was on good ground as well. So, um, yeah, all honours with very elegant um, in this win. She sort of did, she had sort of conditions against, um, not everything went her way, but she was still too good. Absolutely. Now, a very bunch finish. Uh, I'm going to run you through a couple of the the turnarounds in the weights because obviously this was set weights and penalties, the Turnbull, and now we're getting into handicap conditions of the Caulfield Cup. And I want to get your thoughts here. Now, Finch is staying at the same weight, very elegant, dropping only half a kilo, so uh, pretty much the same there. But <clears throat> a couple of these close-up horses, Toffee Tongue drops two and a half kilos, Dallasan drops four kilos, Master of Wine drops three kilos, and Warning drops three and a half kilos there. Now, does that make the task harder for Very Elegant and Finch? Um, yeah, possibly, if you put it that way. Look, as I've said before, I'm not a huge weights person. I think they do mean a lot more in, say, the Cups, those sort of distance races, than they would in, like, a new market handicap or something like that. So, yeah, it's definitely something you could, you could make a point of. Um, but yeah, I I don't sort of pay too much um, too much respect to that. Um, personally, I might be totally wrong, and it means a heap. But um, yeah, I'm more interested in who I think the best horse is, I suppose. Okay, and very elegant and, and Finch. They got fifty five and fifty four and a half. It's not like they're going to be lugging around uh, really big weights here at the twenty four hundred. Um, Finch is an interesting horse to talk about because he. My general feeling with with these major cups is once they have a go at it and fail, it's very hard to come into them again. But he is a he seems a, an always improving uh, European bred horse here, Finch. He's um, he turned up as a, a very lightly raced horse in the Melbourne Cup a couple of years ago, obviously by Frankel. Uh, he ran a really good race in the Caulfield Cup last year to run fifth. Um, has he had too many goes, or is he finally looking like he's going to break through to your eyes? 
Yeah, I don't ha- have a huge issue with him sort of having a few goes at it. Um, I think Finch's biggest issue is that he's a bit one-paced. He sort of lacks that killer punch to really put a race away. And he's always susceptible to a horse sort of coming off his back or a horse who's a little bit more dynamic. In his Turnbull Stakes, he was... He was at least probably equal run to very elegant or even maybe a little bit inferior, but he was another one who was wide and took off early um, and made a long run um, and just sort of wilted a little bit at the end there. Um, but, yeah, I, like he's he's a great chance, I think, in the Caulfield Cup. Like he's, as we share with that map, he's a possible leader in the race without huge huge pressure. Um, if da- He's got Damien Lane going on, who's obviously an excellent jockey, um, won the race last year. Um, but if he can sort of find the front or an on-pace position, roll along at a sort of a – doesn't have to go too hard, but sort of a building tempo, I think that would suit him down to the ground. If they go too slow, then I think he's definitely susceptible to a horse um, who's a bit more dynamic coming off his back and sort of um, dive-bombing him, so to speak. Yeah, okay. What about Master of Wine? Um, are you as sick of this horse as I am? I'm pretty much over him, uh, Master of Wine. He, he, he's promised a lot. Uh, I'm not sure he's delivering for me. Yeah, I'm still hanging on a little bit. Um, Tell us why. How how are you hanging on? Giving up yet? Well, yeah. The big thing for Master of Wine, like he had every chance here. He pretty much had every chance in the Maccabi Diva as well. He still finished off okay here. I don't think the slow tempo suited him that well. And he maybe settled a bit further back than um, I definitely expected going into this race. He's racing like a horse, so he probably wants 2,400 now. He's drawn a barrier to find a find a great spot, and Craig Williams goes on to the horse as well. So to me, he's got a fair few ticks there. Um, if any rain comes, sort of a bit of juice in the ground's no issue for him either. So, yeah, he ticks a few boxes for mine. Um, but, yeah, I would have loved to have seen him put a race away this preparation or sort of be a bit more dynamic through the line um, in his last two starts. But... I definitely think he's going to be thereabouts on Saturday, but um, it, it's, it's definitely D-Day for him. If he um, yeah, if he gets every chance and doesn't quite perform, then, um, yeah, I can near give him life. Yeah, okay, and there's a, a few outsiders here, not despised by any stretch. Um, well, it's probably a bit harsh to call Toffee Tongue an outsider. She's willing commission here. We've got Toffee Tongue warning Dallasan. Do you have any preference uh, among these three going into the Cup? Yeah, definitely warning. Um, I was a bit disappointed to see this horse draw barrier 20 because I assume they're going to be fairly negative on it and just sort of sit it towards the rear of the field. Um, now, if if you forgot this horse's three-year-old season where obviously it won a Victorian derby, but then after that it sort of it was just okay. It was nothing sort of special. But both its runs back this preparation have been outstanding. Um, it's late sectionals um, first up. I think it ran the best last 200 of the Maccabi Diva, which over an unsuitable mile. And then um, in this race here, it's run the six fastest last 200 of the meeting and the fastest last 200 um, of this race. Um, coming from well back and sort of in between horses. So getting out to the 2400 looks ideal for him. Any rain that comes uh, won't be an issue, particularly if the rain comes and the inside chops up a fair bit and they're able to come really wide around the turn. I think that'll play into his hands as well. Um, But yeah, like I suppose a little issue with him is Caulfield as well. All his best form tends to be on the bigger tracks like Flemington. Um, And he had that one run at Caulfield, um, last spring where he sort of sat back and wide and it was a bit of an unsuitable speed for him his run prior to the derby um and he was only just fair so that's the Caulfield's a little worry for him um uh, but yeah I think at the odds on offer um based purely on his two runs back so far um he's, he's probably over the odds in the race okay let's uh let's pull this market back up now and we're going to go through quickly these runners one by one um, Anthony Van Dyke, could you see yourself backing him? I could, uh, but yeah, if it, the track gets into the soft range, then um, I won't be. Okay, Avilius? He's a horse who would be suited by um, by a bit of rain. Um, he's going okay. His last run was pretty good in a really slowly run race in Sydney, but um, he's another who's probably going to be settling right back. Um, he's possibly over the odds there at sort of $34, but he's probably not a horse I'd be backing. He's going to need a lot of rain, isn't he, Avilius? Yeah. Um, Vow and Declare, second in this race last year, then won the Melbourne Cup, and now he is uh, unwanted. Um, warranted? 
Uh, yeah, it is for me. Don't think he's quite going as well. He's obviously right up in the weights uh, now. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd want to see him sort of return to some kind of form before I'd be interested in him backing him again. Okay. Do you know anything about Buckhurst? Do we need to defer to my extensive international experience? Well, I know that... Um, I know that uh, Ben Mellon's riding it. He's, I think he's placed in the race the last three years, and this is a horse that'll be sort of racing close to the speed. Um, and it looks sort of a, a, a nice type for a Caulfield Cup, given I think 2400's its go, and it's got a good racing style. Um, now, I think it's won a couple of races on soft tracks, but ideally it wouldn't want too much rain to come. That's sort of the extent of my knowledge. All right, one thing I noticed with Buckhurst, it got beat a... F- uh a nose first up over a mile and then one over 2,000 metres, which uh, it's won a, a few races over. Um, that's pretty rare to see a, an international come out with, with sort of speed at those distances. So, uh, yeah, I think he's uh, definitely a, a chance of winning this race, Buckhurst. What about the Metrop winner, Mirage Dancer? Yeah, there seems to be plenty of interest in this horse around the traps. Um, it I'd say it won the Metrop getting every chance. Got a nice split down towards the inside. It was an excellent ride by Nashra Willer. Um, it's, I think it did run third in this race last year, I think, or it was close up in this race last year. Uh, I don't think it's hopeless, but, um, yeah, it's not a horse I'd find. Generally, I don't really like that Metrop form. I think it's a bit of a weak weak race. And this year outside Mugger 2, it, um, who obviously this horse beat, um, yeah, it wasn't the strongest race. So I'm happy to let this horse go around without mine. Yeah, I agree with you. I think he did have every chance there in the Metrop. Um, Mustajir, 100 to 1, enough said? Enough said. Very elegant. Uh, could you see yourself backing her <coughs> at uh, what sort of price or conditions? Yeah, well, the, the big thing with her is going to be, um, obviously, if the rain comes. If we get into that soft range and even to, like in deep into the soft range, it's obviously the market's really going to come for her, I think. Um so even if that does happen, I don't. So say, say if she started closer to four dollars um, with the rain coming, then it's probably a little bit short for me, sort of around Caulfield. Um, but yeah, if it if it does get the soft rain, she's definitely a deserved favourite. Uh, we saw her last start; she's not she's not hopeless if it's dry ground. But yeah, if the track stays dry, she's not really a horse I want to be with. But she's definitely a winning chance still. Yeah, only on soft track for me. But the problem with that is if the rain comes, I think everyone's going to be jumping on her. So she's going to be probably about as short as you'd want to back her anyway. What about this uh, this son of Nathaniel, Dashing Willoughby? Yeah, so he's won um, two from three this preparation uh, back in the UK. Um, his first up win was over 2,400 which before going out to sort of longer distances, which... Um, watching those races at longer distances, he looked really one-paced and was um, just plugging away. Now, um, having done a bit of research on the horse, I think 2,400 seems to be its best distance. So maybe those distances were just too far for it. So that's why it gave the amount, look, looked like it was sort of going up and down on the spot. It was it was sort of getting very tired. So yeah, back to 2,400 should suit. I don't love that inside gate for the internationals. Like gate two around Caulfield, it's sort of very different to, I suppose, what that experience in the UK. So he's going to need to jump well. And if he does jump well, he's a horse that can race close to the speed. Um, so um, obviously that will be to his advantage. I think Michael Walker's chosen this horse over his old favourite, Prince of Aaron, as well. Yeah, it's an interesting league, given the success he's had there. Concussion plates first time, that can't be a good thing. Yeah, I'll... I'll I'd be a little bit wary of those gear changes for internationals because sometimes he might be... They say first time, obviously first time in Australia, he maybe wears them um, every start he has. I'm not sure. Maybe, like, we'll obviously try and chase up a bit of news on that. But, um, yeah, there's some chance he just wears them all the time. But the fact that it's the first time in Australia, uh, for some reason, uh, Racing Australia love to say, like, first time. That's a very good point you make. Um, I think you're... Inside barrier point is very valid here. If it gets locked away on the fence, it's got absolutely none, having seen its replays. What about Finch? Yay or nay for you? Uh, it's a yay for me. Um, I think there's no doubt Finch is going to be in the finish somewhere, um, whether it's first across the line or sort of... It's definitely, obviously, I'd be surprised if it doesn't run sort of in the top five. Um, it's possible leader in the race. As we mentioned, D Lane goes on, a gun jockey. Um, pretty much handles any conditions. So if the rain comes, it's not the end of the world um, for it. And, and obviously, ran well in this race last year after being wide for sort of the first half of the race. Uh, wide, no cover for the first half of the race. So 
Um, yeah, I get your point about sort of um, having plenty of goes at it, um, but it just ticks a few boxes for me. It loved its lead up run in the Turnbull as well. So yeah, it's definitely a chance for me. Yeah, I brought up the point. I'm probably going to go against it, though. I'm pretty happy with Finch in this race. I also do like his third up here in the Caulfield Cup. Last year, he was fourth up. I think as he gets older, a um, little bit more freshness in the legs. I like that for Finch. What about Prince of Aaron uh, for your girl, Jamie? Yeah, well, uh, M. Walker off, J. Carr on. I'm very happy to see that. Um, I think it's a great upgrade for the horse. Now, this is a horse who I'd throw out all its UK form and just look at what it does in Australia and it's actually yet to miss a place um, in, in any run since coming or when it's come to Australia so it's a horse that obviously loves uh, loves the conditions down here um, it'll roll forward from that wide gate um, the little issue I suppose with it probably wants dry ground ideally uh, but sort of bit of juice in the ground isn't the end of the world and I have heard uh, some people say that maybe this is a bit of a prep run for the Melbourne Cup, um, given that it's sort of already in the, into the Melbourne Cup. It doesn't need to win anything or qualify or anything like that. So that's maybe a little concern. But as you can see there, sort of $26 best price. Um, if it goes around sort of that around that $30 mark, I, the sort of horse I'd probably have something on. Interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm leaning against Prince of Aaron, but uh, I knew you wouldn't be able to resist your girl Jamie with, with a little sneaky. What about Master of Wine? I've already said I've had enough of it. Um, you're going to give us a, a really squeaky yay, I think. Yeah, I'm, he's another one that I could see myself backing. Um, I'm a forgiving man, so um, if he's sort of around that $10 mark, as I mentioned before, he ticks a few boxes. Um, it feels like the Hawks are obviously great grand final trainers, as we saw last week with Ole Kirk. So um, I'm going to trust that this has been the plan the whole time. Uh, they're going to have him cherry ripe on the day, um, and yeah, he's got to run to his best. Um, obviously, if he doesn't perform, then yeah, I'm happy to sort of put the pen through him to a degree. All right, good luck. The chosen one. I actually backed this horse in the race last year, coming off winning the Herbert Power, and it was a bit um, ordinary. I um, don't think it's going as well this time, so, yeah, no for me. Uh, we know warning is a yes for you. Dallasan, uh, what was your reasons against Dallasan here? Yeah, I'm not massively convinced about 2,400 for it, and I would have loved to have seen it have draw, like, a nice inside barrier to have a really soft run on the fence. Obviously, it gets Willie Pike going on, so it loses nothing there. But, yeah, I just think at the end of 2400, there's going to be a few horses in this race that are a bit stronger at it and um, a bit better. Right. What about uh, True Self? She was racing pretty well out here last year, but uh, she's getting on for a mare, True Self. Yeah, she was unlucky in the Geelong Cup and then won the Queen Elizabeth last spring. Um, looking at her form this time in, she did blow the start in the E-ball last start, but I don't think she's going as well um, as she was last spring. I'm a little bit surprised um, how short she is, um, to be honest. But, yeah, she does love soft ground, so any rain that comes um, will be to her advantage. But, yeah, not a horse I could find. There we go. Pick yourself up a few coins and lay in the commission-free Betfair market there for true self. Actow's out, replaced by Raheen House. What was your word? No. No? Toffee Tongue? Um, didn't like it as much as warning reasons? I just think, like, she sort of had every possible chance in the turn. Well, I think the slow speed possibly helped her as well. Um and she did start massive odds in that Turnbull. And if you said to me prior to the Turnbull, I look, this horse would be $15 in a Caulfield Cup, I'm going off its previous form. It won, won at Oaks in Adelaide, getting a saloon run up the inside as well, um, not beating sort of, uh, I think beat Moonlight Maid, who was quite unlucky that day, or put up a big performance. So, yeah, I just don't quite think she's good enough. Um, she obviously fits the profile of a um, Caulfield Cup winner, a four-year-old mare with no weight, well-drawn, uh, winner of an Oaks coming off a placing in the Turnbull. Um, so, yeah, you can easily make a case for her, but, yeah, not one for me. Yeah, I, I have my doubts she's good enough as well, Toffee Tongue. And then the bottom one, Chapada. Now, a lot of these cups, we always get these horses that win their way in. Um, they come off what is generally regarded as weaker form lines, but invariably they do run well in these type of races. Do you think Chapada is one of those? Yeah, I'd be surprised if he runs poorly. He obviously won the Herbert Power last week, and his first up run in the naturalism was excellent as well. I just probably would have liked to have seen him being a bit more dominant last week um, to be up to a Caulfield Cup, but yeah, 
I'd be very surprised if he doesn't sort of finish better than midfield. Um, but yeah, he's not a horse I could back. All right. Uh, let's pull up our recommendations on the race. Now, I've almost had to go for a really small font for you, Balls. You're going to talk through six of us that are on your radar. Give us the conditions that you could back each runner. Yeah, so I don't really, I'm not really locked into anything at the moment. These are horses, I suppose, that most interest me. You'd almost throw very elegant in there as well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Anthony I couldn't Van fit Dyke. it in. <laughs> Anthony Van Dyke, obviously, I'd want to see dry ground, um, and I'd need to probably talk myself into it a bit more. But um, he's he's a horse that definitely interests me, given um, his European form looks excellent, um, to my knowledge. Um, yeah, Buckhurst is one. Uh, Lloyd Williams owned Ben Mellon ridden that races close to the speed um, it's uh, lead up form possibly is, obviously isn't as good as a state horse like Anthony Van Dyke but just seems to fit the profile of a Caulfield Cup horse um, coming from Europe and those connections obviously know what kind of horse they need to bring to win this sort of race uh, Finch was sort of been through ticks a lot of boxes main query is sort of lacking a killer punch but got no doubt she'll uh, she'll be will be around uh, the finish somewhere. Um, Prince of Aaron, obviously, that has that excellent record in Australia. Rolls forward for Jamie Carr. A uh, little bit of a concern. It's a prep run for the Melbourne Cup, but um, I think sort of at around $30, um, it's worth having something on. Uh, Master of Wine, another sort of box ticker for me. Uh, looks to map well, good jockey, set for the race. Um, any juice in the tracks, no issue for us. Um, sort of one last chance. And then, yeah, warnings one that I think is just going under the radar um, a lot, considering I, I think after its three-year-old season, a lot of people would have sort of written it off as a Cups chance. Uh, but, yeah, its first two runs back have been excellent. Um, obviously, the barrier 20 and probably going back to near last is a bit, bit of an issue. But, um, obviously, if the rain comes and they're sort of, making ground out wide then yeah you can definitely promote him all right looks like you'll be making a book on the Caulfield Cup rather than zeroing in on one or two runners fair say yeah that's highly likely okay I'm I'm narrowing it down a little bit now Anthony Van Dyke I think if it's firmer ground I'm not too worried about the barriers I think this horse is going to roll forward and uh, yeah, I'm happy to back him. If the rain comes, I'll probably just shoulder arms on him. And Finch is the other one we've talked about, uh, rolling forward. I'm, I'm going with two horses rolling forward in this race here and uh, hopefully getting a result with one of them. So there's our look at the Caulfield Cup. It's nothing if not uh, in-depth. Balls, as always, a big thanks to you for all your hard work on this show. If you've got to the end of the show... As a viewer, thanks very much for watching. Uh, let us know your thoughts. Throw a tip down there in the in the comments section. Um, put your neck on the line and revel in the glory if you do find the winner afterwards. And uh, we will see you next week for the review show and another preview show, which uh, no doubt will be the Cox Plate. But if there's another race that you're desperate to hear our thoughts on, feel free to let us know. Uh, balls. Until next time, thanks very much. Thanks, Heath.